Okay, now in this video we're going to have a look at different methods of either detecting substances or determining exactly what a substance is. And the first and most simple method which I'm going to speak about is known as chromatography. Chromatography. You can call this simple chromatography or the correct term you can call it paper chromatography. And this is because we use a piece of special paper, um, chromatography paper, during the experiment. And one of the most obvious examples of when this is used is to separate things like food dyes. So food additives, food dyes, um, because these substances are easy to see on paper. They are physically different colours and so we can see that they have separated. And the way this works is we start off with a glass jar, like so, and inside we are going to put our chromatography paper, like this. I've left gaps for obvious reasons. And so we have inside what we call the solvent. So it's just a liquid. The solvent can be various different things but it is a solvent, it's going to be dissolving the compounds that we are analysing. And so this is the solvent. And now what you need to know is that these substances will move a certain amount up the chromatography paper. And they will move at different speeds. So let's say we have these different coloured dyes here and these are all moving uh, like so. The reason they have moved is because the solvent will rise up the chromatography paper and the speed at which these, these substances move depends on which dye they are because each dye will interact with the paper in a different way. So for example, this yellow guy really likes getting a firm hold of the paper and refuses to be dragged up the paper very fast. So it's really resisting the flow as the solvent's moving up the paper. And that's why it's moved up to here in a given amount of time. Let's say that this total thing was after, say, five minutes or so. So after five minutes. This blue line here, well, this die has moved further. Also likes to take a, quite a firm hold on the paper, but the interaction with the paper is not as strong as the yellow one, so it's dragged further. And now this red guy over here um, cannot grip the paper very well and so is forced to drag way up the paper as the solvent rises up the paper. And so that is why you've got these varying positions. Now, if we compare these to chromatograms, they're called. So this is called a chromatogram. The result of chromatography is a chromatogram just like a diagram. If we compare the chromatogram to one of a known substance, so if we have a dye and we know exactly what it is, and we do exactly the same experiment for exactly the same amount of time, then the dye will move exactly the same distance. And so if we had a, if we had a known chromatogram and there was a dye which moved exactly this distance, then we can say, well, this dye is the dye in our reference chromatogram. So we have found out what this dye is by looking at an experiment that has been done with a known substance. And so in that way we can identify what the dyes are given that someone has done these experiments in the past. Okay so that's very useful and it is certainly something that you can do in a lab. It's very easy to recreate and it's not very expensive. We're going to move on now to very much more expensive processes. And there are two processes. One of those is gas chromatography. So it's still chromatography, but it is done very differently. Now what happens in gas chromatography is we, of course, we use a gas rather than a liquid as our substance. And so if we have a tube which might look something like this, doesn't really matter about the shape for now. You won't be tested on the shape of it or anything. But let's say this is a tube. The tube is going to be full of solids. So you've got all these solids dotted through the tube. And these solids basically 
do the same job as the paper in the liquid chromatography. So in the paper chromatography as we saw above. So when we pump in our sample, these solids will slow down the sample. So we begin, we begin with a gas sample, which goes through here. So we have a gas sample, and that is carried with a carrier gas. And that's just to help it through the tube. And then as it comes out the end, we have what's called a detector. So a detector, which is just a piece of machinery here. And that will detect how long it's taken for certain materials to get through the tube or the column. We call this the column. And depending on how long they've taken, in the same way that we did with the paper chromatography, we can compare that to a known experiment and the time should be the same. So if we have a known experiment of a certain substance and it takes one minute and our experiment takes one minute, we know that our substance is that one from the known experiment. Okay? And the time it takes is known as the retention time. So the retention time is how long the sample gas is retained in the column. And what you will get out as a reading will look something like this. We have a set of axes and we'll have a line. Let's say for example we have this occurring, this occurring, and then this occurring here. On our axes, we have retention time, retention time, and what is known as recorder response. Don't worry about this. This just basically means how strong the signal is, recorder response. And so, because, let's say that this is one, two, three. These three peaks here tell us that we have three separate substances in our sample. And because the peak for number two is the biggest, that tells us that we have the most of number two. So in our mixture, the most common thing that we have in our mixture is substance two, and we have very little of substance three. So that's all this is going to tell us, and it's very useful for telling us how much of something is in a mixture and how many uh, different substances are also in that mixture. Now this is all well and good, but it doesn't differentiate between two substances which are very similar. And also, it won't tell us exactly how big a substance is or anything else if we haven't got a reference sample for that substance. So often, we couple with something known as mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry. Now mass spectrometry is a very complicated process it basically involves turning everything into an ion and then using its charge in order to separate them. But what we end up with from mass spectrometry is a graph that looks something like this. And so we have percentage abundance on the y-axis. This just tells you how much of the thing you have. And then on the x-axis, you have something called MZ, and we don't need to know what MZ means. It's basically going to tell us how heavy what we have is. So if we have 0, 10, 20, 30, for example, you'll get a series of different peaks. And so perhaps you have one here, one here, one here, one there, one there, one there. And then finally, we have one here. Now, the one which we are most interested in is the biggest one. And by biggest, I mean the highest value on the x-axis. I don't mean the tallest, because that's this one here. But I mean the largest, so the furthest to the right, the highest value on the x-axis, which is this here. This is known as the molecular ion peak. And you see that has a value of 30 in this case. That tells us that the MR of this substance is equal to 30. So remember the relative molecular mass or the relative formula mass from previous videos tells us how heavy a substance is. So how many protons and neutrons that substance has. This is extremely useful in figuring out exactly what the substance is. And here we are given a direct value. So this is extremely powerful.
On top of this, the rest of these peaks are, they almost act like a fingerprint. So we say this here is the fingerprint region. The fingerprint region. And that's because every substance will have a specific pattern. So if we had two substances that we were separating that both had a molecular ion peak of 30, the other substance, let's draw another one in yellow, the other substance might have exactly the same molecular ion peak here, but the other one might have a fingerprint region which looks more like this. And so obviously the yellow lines are in different places to the red lines, and so we can compare the two and realize that we have two different substances here. If we then analyze those, we can work out exactly what it is we have. And so this is extremely useful. And as I said before, if we couple the two together, so gas chromatography plus mass spectrometry, we get an extremely powerful method of separating and identifying different compounds. So what actually happens is after the gas chromatography, we pump that sample directly into the mass spectrometer and therefore we have a two-step process which is going to give us very very precise and accurate results. Now in summary, paper chromatography is cheap so it's easy to use, easy to use and it's sufficient for common substances, if we have a reference. Sufficient for common substances. Now the downside, of course, is it is not precise. It's not precise. And we need reference to determine what the substance actually is. Now gas chromatography and mass spectrometry the good thing about those is they are very precise. They are very precise. We don't always need a reference. If we use both, we can often figure out what something is without using a reference. So we don't always need a reference. We can use tiny samples. They're very sensitive. They're very sensitive. And they are also very fast. So with paper chromatography we've got to wait for the solvent to rise up the paper. Uh, with gas chromatography and mass spec they are actually very quick. And the obvious downsides are they are very expensive to do. These guys you will not be doing in any sort of lab at school uh, just because the machinery can cost up to hundreds of thousands of pounds. So they're very expensive and you also need special training in order to use the equipment. So training to use. You can't just turn one on and it tells you what to do, you have to know exactly how to use the equipment. Okay, and finally, sometimes you still need a reference. So sometimes you still need reference substances. So like I said, if a substance has already been tested in the past, you can compare your results to previous results. So that was an overview of those different techniques. I hope it's helped sort of clear everything up. I haven't gone into exactly how mass spectrometry works because that's not required for your syllabus. But if you do want to know, then please do feel free to Google it or you can ask me in an email and I'll be happy to help. So please do also comment below if you do have any questions. But I look forward to seeing you in the next video.